Well, I don't think Shan needs much of an introduction, uh, but uh, a very well-known Hopf algebra specialist talking about um, a planar spider theorem and asymmetric Frobenius algebras. Thanks very much, Alex. So, um, as you know, I'm sort of trying to slowly get into quantum computing, so I'm not really an expert on a lot of things that you guys are experts on. But one thing that really intrigued me when I was uh, here last spring was, I mean, at CQC last spring, was um, this whole, all the theory around these Frobenius and special Frobenius, et cetera. So um, the, I guess the importance of these is well known to everybody here, but particularly in the commutative case or perhaps in the non-commutative but symmetric Frobenius form case. And then there are already known spider theorems. And in fact, the general case, it seems to be somewhat, um, seems less well known. Um, uh, so we, so when I was here last, I was asking around for, if anyone knew where there was a proof and nobody could tell me. So in the end, we, we worked out a proof with Constanza Reach here. I should say all of this is joint work um, and uh, appears in this paper, but it will be in the updated version. I'm gonna be talking about some of the stuff that isn't in the current version, but we'll update it soon. Um, anyway, yeah, so we worked out a proof of the spider theorem in the general case. So I will tell you about that. Um, then uh, I want, to, but the real question that I'm interested in is what are, you know, how, what, what is the moduli of Frobenius structures? How, how often do you get them? And what, how do you classify them? So on any Hopf algebra, for example, you do have a canonical Frobenius structure given from the integrals. And um, that's a old result of Paragus, but I, the, all the specific formulae for quantum SL2, I'll, I'll, to, I'll take from this paper here. Um, I talked about this paper before, it generalizes to the graded case. Um, now, beyond the group case, the ones that come from Hopf algebras, uh, the interesting Hopf algebras tend to be not semi-simple. And that results in the, in the, um, in the, the things of interest for a special Frobenius thing, the little bead thing, um, is trivial, is zero. So they're not basically uninteresting. Um, so the question is, what else is out there? Are there significant classes of asymmetric Frobenius algebras? Are there asymmetric special Frobenius algebras? And how can we classify them in general? So that's, what, that's the topic of today's talk. Now, um, start with uh, some basics which here everybody knows. So I'm gonna read, just to remind you, I'm gonna read all my diagrams flowing down the page. So in the diagrammatic form, uh, a special Frobenius, uh, I mean, well, a Frobenius algebra, um, it's just the black bits, uh, means an object in a, in a model category with a compatible product, which is written with like, like that, uh, co-product, which is written like that, um, and co-unit epsilon and unit one, Obeying all these axioms, so basically it's um, uh, the there's a coalgebra and an algebra. Um, that's what this says, and then these are the compatibility between them. So here, I think everybody knows this. Now, the special case um, is when this particular combination is equal to the identity. So that's um, a special one. Now, um, the first thing we do in the paper is to just recast this because. Actually, these, algebra, these axioms are hugely redundant. So for a mathematician, this is not a good definition. There are much smaller number of axioms you need. So one set which we found interesting was to, it was this one. So this lemma says that this, uh, these usual notion of Frobenius algebra is equivalent to specifying these morphisms uh, and a map, uh, so a morphism, uh, which we'll call one. Um, such that this whole, so firstly, th th this is just a duality, so it's a subdual object. Uh, secondly, um, this is half an identity. And, um, and then we don't even assume, and then we assume associativity over here. And this one, you could also be turned upside down and have the other one, which, which defines the co-product. But anyway, this is another one, one of the identities we need. It's special. If, uh, so the claim is that those are that's equivalent to the full set. Um, it's special if and only if um, this thing, which we call the lollipop, uh, is equal to one. And um, you can also replace if you want the axiom is more symmetrical. You can replace this one by this one. That's a bit more symmetrical from left. If you want left right symmetry. Um, anyway, anyway, so um, that's the formulation. Now the nice thing about this is. 
is if we're interested in the special case, we don't even have a one because the one is actually absorbed in, the, in this, is one is already in this. So actually for a special Frobenius algebra, we just actually interested just in these morphisms and the one is for free. Um, okay. Uh, the proof is entirely elementary. I, I don't, I'm not even going to, for this group, I'm not even going to go through it, except just to focus on this bit. So the, um, the, this was the special property, the thing that, that should be the identity. Now, for, well, firstly, you prove, you, you doing various operations, you prove all the things you expect. In particular, you prove all the duals, all the upside down versions of all these also hold. Uh, in particular, upside down version of this one, which is, I, I labeled these by the number of ins and number of outs. So this is, the, this is two, one. The dual one is one, two. So now using the one, two axiom to, to, to write the co-product, I can replace that using the one, two identity um, by, by this squiggle here. And then, uh, then I can use associativity to put this branch on the other side and I get this. And so that tells you that being, a spe being, um, the, being special is the same thing as this lollipop being, being a unit map, a unit of the algebra. That's the way I like to think of it. Now, the spider theorem in, in the general case, um, this, is, this, is, this is kind of folklore, and I, um, it's not, not claiming to be particularly new. A special Frobenius algebra is equivalent to morphisms, um, just these morphisms, I don't have to worry about the one anymore, such that for every M and N, all compositions with M legs in and N legs out are equal. And um, that's a pretty strong statement. It's not only, um, is it, it also says that actually this is exactly what Fabinius, special Fabinius algebra is. It captures, it's the unique thing with that property. Um, okay, the, uh, because of that statement, that means in particular, they're all equal to one particular form. So there's a standard form, which is the spider one. There's nothing particularly special about the spider form. It just looks nice and gives you a nice name. So this you can blame Bob and Ross Duncan and people for this. Uh, but anyway, it works the same way. Um, but the only difference is that this is now a connected planar diagram uh, for this equality to hold. Um, there are some special cases. Now, the proof, um, we thought it wasn't known when we were writing the paper because I did ask around everywhere. But since the preprint came out, Chris Honan pointed out that it is in their book, uh, Categories for uh, Quantum Theory Introduction. So, so this is not the first proof, but I will show you our proof because it's a little bit different. Um, Okay, so what's the idea of the proof? The idea is to use induction on the number of those operations. Um, so for small numbers, that's basically what the lemma does. Because if you look at if you look at it, the lemma was basically identities of the form where maps with the same number of in and out legs were, were equal. And so by the time you finish the lemma, you've actually proven that. Uh, the um, now for the inductive step, we consider a diagram the diagram that remains after deleting the last operation. So the last operation will be one of these four. And so we've got four possibilities. Actually, uh, well, we've got one of these possibilities here. The, uh, for the inductive, um, yeah. For the inductive step, uh, yeah, as I said, remove, remove the last operation. Now that will break the remaining diagram into components, maybe two components, but they will all have a smaller number of operations. And therefore by induction, we can assume that they all given in the standard form. So that's what I've done here. There are five cases to consider. Um, if this is the last operation, if you remove it, you've got this thing. And because it's uh, it got smaller number, I can replace it by the spider. So I've done that everywhere. Here also replace it by the spider, but I've used associativity to massage it into this form, co-associativity. And here again, I've used, I, I just, each box is replaced, each connected component is replaced by the spider. Um, and then I've just used associativity, co associativity to write it like this. So our diagram with the last operation will be one of these cases. And then we can use some of these identities. So in particular, this identity here, which I've proven here, I can replace this by, by, the, by this. So if you stick that in there, then you can reorganize by associativity and reorganize both co associativity and get a new spider. So and that's the same for all of these. So that's the basic idea of the proof. It's not, it's not too hard as long as you organize it, it well. There are some special cases to consider. Okay. Um, now, uh, corollary of this is, well, actually you can get the, the non-connected, the, the general one. So for any Frobenius algebra, it doesn't have to be special. Um, you will have, now you'll also have some ones and epsilons thrown in, um, but 
they, you can still have the same result that they're equal if, if, they're, if they have the same connected planar diagram with same number of legs in and out. And here we take a standard form, which will then be like this. This is A. Now the proof, first thing you do is you prune off, you argue, you have, it's a little bit of an intricate argument, but you argue that you can get rid of all the ones and epsilons. It's obvious if they're at the ends, but if they're in the middle of the thing, you've got, uh, when you apply them, um, applying the epsilon to the co-product, to, to this, for example, will turn it into this. Then, you, then you've got to see you know, what, what effect that has. And you could get a chain of, of things. So you, it takes a little bit of arguing. Um, but the business end is, is that um, otherwise it proceeds in the same way, except that you're going to have some of these things which are no longer the identity. But the thing about these beads is that you can prove using you know, the usual properties that you can take the bead through. So you, the bead just goes through all, all of the products and co-products. And that means you can just collect them all in the middle if you want. And that's the proof. Now, the number of beads has a topological meaning. It's the number of bounded connected components of the complement of the diagram. And during the whole proof, that number is preserved. So that's what's going on here. OK, so I think there's a nice sort of interplay between topology uh, of, of planar diagrams and Fabinius algebras. Um, as I said, you will find a, another proof in, in Chris's book, Chris and Vickery, uh, Jamie Vickery's proof, uh, book. Um, now, we're going to be interested in um, some special quantities to try to classify stru structures. So firstly, there's this lollipop I already mentioned. So this is the thing. Uh, now, one lemma is this object, this element of the algebra is always in the center. So firstly, it's a great way of generating the elements of the center, if you don't know what the center looks like. Uh, and it's equal to one, as I mentioned, in the special case. Uh, on the dual side, this one here, this is therefore equal to epsilon in the special case, uh, if and only if. Uh, but in this context, there's a, another interesting property we can ask, which is that we can ask that this guy vanishes on commutators. So it's a trace. Is it, you know, when you've got a, a linear function on, on an algebra, it's useful to know if it's a trace, it behaves like a trace, meaning that it vanishes on commutators. So that's a reasonable thing to ask for. And we'll say that the Fabina structure is weakly symmetric in that case, for reasons which will become clear a little bit later. Uh, it turns out symmetry implies this property. So that's why it's weakly symmetric. And the other thing of interest is, is, is just the circle. So that's just a number, an element of the field. And, um, and the lemma is that this is equal to just the usual dimension in the symmetric case. So we call this the F dimension. So these are elementary things that you can prove that we, we give the proofs in the paper. Um, now, once you've got this far, then you might as well have a whole family of F dimensions. So given the Frobenius algebra, you can not just write down the circle. You can also write down, well, the empty circle. So sort of, this is just epsilon of one, that's a, that's a certain number. Then you can write down what the, the, the the, the dumbbell and you know and j j fold circles. So now because of this spider theorem, we know that actually this is the same as this because it's got the same number of ins and outs and same uh, number of uh, connected bounded connected components of the complement. So the same topological um, sort of uh, type. Uh, and um, so you could, so actually this thing can be computed as just the lollipop element multiplied j times and then apply epsilon at the end. Uh, now this gives you the Hilbert, uh, the, given all these dimensions, you might as well organize it into, into a Hilbert series. So, that, so dim x of a is a polynomial in x defined by this power series. So this dim x of a gives us a lot of information about the Frobenius algebra. And as far as I know, this hasn't been studied before. Um, now, the other thing which I think computer scientists don't seem to know um, is that if you have a if you have a Frobenius algebra, so a this is the inner product, this is the this is the this is the cup, this is the cap in a in, in the diagrammatic notation. I call it the metric G. Um, if you have a Frobenius algebra, then any other Frobenius structure on A corresponds to a, uh, to a, uh, an invertible element A in A. And the way it corresponds is given element U, um, we can just define a new Frobenius form by, um, by just multiplying by A by U and then applying the old Frobenius form. On the dual side, it means that the new metric or the new, new um, cap, if you want, uh, is given by the old cap. Now, this is just a notation. Sigma G1 tensor G2, and I might not even write the sigma. It's just a notation for an element of A tensor A. 
which is which is the cap. Uh, I mean the yeah the cap. Um, and and this so over here that on this side it corresponds to taking a u inverse here. This is why you need u to be invertible. Now the converse is also true. So if you've got another Frobenius form uh, prime, we can use the first one to identify a with a star in this way. And then we can look at epsilon prime that goes with this one. So this one can be written as, it, as, uh, you know, as epsilon prime and the product. And then apply, so epsilon prime is just, is just this other one applied to one. Uh, but that's an element of a star. And therefore we can pull it back by this isomorphism to an element of the, over here. And this is, this is U. So it's a one, it goes both ways. So that actually means you can get all Frobenius structures on any algebra just by classifying the invertible elements. Now, under twisting, this, we call this process twisting. So if you start off with G and you make this twisting, then the lollipop twisted just because it has the U inverse in the middle, it now becomes this, right? This, this was the lollipop. It was to apply the cap and then apply the product. So that, that, that's, so that's this, this is the product here. Um, the upside down lollipop looks like this, there's a summation missing if you like, uh, but actually you can organize that as epsilon um, of the old epsilon times this. So actually it's, it's actually the, this, the, the, lin the linear form provided by this twisted one is actually the original linear form, but twisted by this element, but this element need not be invertible. It's not a Frobenius structure, but it is, it, is, it, is a, a, it is a linear form, which defines a bilinear form. Now, uh, some lemmas. If the initial Frobenius algebra on A is symmetric, then the twisted one is weakly symmetric, if and only if this guy is in the center. And it's symmetric if, if, if U itself is in the center. Now, lollipop is, this guy is always in the center. So, so that means if, it's, if U is in the center, then then since that's always in the center, then U times the lollipop is in the center. So that's why symmetric implies weakly symmetric. Um, but this is, this is how, so from the point of view of U's, a lot of thick properties of Frobenius structures become um, sort of quite easy to calculate. Uh, and this, so, okay. Now, um, the, but the takeaway from this is the dimension of all Frobenius structures is just the dimension of A. It's the invertible elements in A, it's the same dimension as the moduli space. And the symmetric ones, because assuming there exists at least one, then the symmetric ones, um, assuming this, they exist as, um, yeah, if, assuming that, that A has a symmetric one to begin with, then twisting by it just corresponds to elements of the center. So then the symmetric one, all the other symmetric ones, are given by twisting so that moduli space is the dimension of, of, of the center of A. I suppose it's possible that a Frobenius form could admit no symmetric one. I haven't really investigated that. Okay, let's look at all of this in the case of n by n matrices, uh, d by d matrices. Uh, we're going to assume that K is, uh, is characteristic zero and that it's sufficiently large to solve any algebraic equations we're interested in, uh, for example, C. Um, a is going to be d by d matrices. And then what we've just seen is that all Frobenius structures are given by twisting. So they're all given by elements, invertible elements of, of A, which just means invertible matrices U. So they're just given by invertible matrices U and they have this form. The, um, the, 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 um, okay, the, um, there's a, there is a, an equals missing here. There's a typo. The lollipop equals trace U inverse. So that means that it's always quasi special. It's a multiple of the identity, and this is the multiple. Um, epsilon of, uh, of one, which we call dimension zero, is trace u. So, that, so trace u and trace u inverse each play a role. This is dimension zero, and this is the value of the lollipop as a, as a quasi special um, thing. It's just given by a scale. And the dimension one is just given by the product of those two. So for a matrix, you know, these are just independent quantities. Um, the, the Frobenius, the Hilbert series is then given by this from what I've to told you, because the lollipop is this, the lollipop squared is just this squared, et cetera. So you could just get a geometric series. So you just get this. Now, if you want to know whether this is weakly symmetric or not, the answer is it's weakly symmetric if either trace of U inverse is zero, 
because then it's weakly symmetric because the lollipop is zero and the lollipop times u was was the twisted lollipop times u, the original lollipop times u is the twisted lollipop so okay so that's um so that's one possibility and the other possibility is is that u is um is just a multiple of the identity and that means that the twisted one uh, it remains remains symmetric. So basically, it's either asymmetric with trace u in versus zero, or it's symmetric. So those are the possibilities for weekly. Now, there's a little calculation here. I don't know if I, if I should really let me just see the time. Um, maybe I'm going. Maybe I'll just only zoom through this very quickly. So the cap, as I mentioned, so you just use a basis of 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 m n of m d of k. The e i j s are the elementary matrices the the cap is just the twisted cap is just like this then and then you just work out um uh, you, here we're just checking that it, it indeed the twisted um the, the this twisted that this is true that that this twisted one indeed works when you when you apply it okay I'm, i think i'm just going to skip that the, the, the bottom line is you can then calculate what the twisted lollipop looks like and it just comes out to be to be trace of u inverse. Okay, so now let's do the more interesting case of a semi-simple algebra. So, over a semi simple for a semi-simple algebra, flat-dimensional algebra, it's actually well known that um, that there's a unique symmetric special Frobenius form. So that's like a starting point, a well-known result. And the way the proof goes, well, there are different proofs, but the way that one proof goes is to is to use the fact that a will have a block decomposition into blocks of different sizes. And um, on each block, uh, we'll take, we, it's a matrix block, so we've got the previous, re, previous calculation, but we'll scale it by di. Uh, and that's so that the combined one is actually just the, the, tr the trace over A in the left regular representation. Um, so that, that, so that, that particular construction takes you to the canonical, um, special Frobenius structure, symmetric Frobenius structure, which is just the trace in the left regular representation uh, on a semi-simple algebra. Now we're going to take that as the base for twisting. So now we're going to twist. So we take our algebra, we take a twisting element u, where each ui is in the block, is in the, M, in the di block, uh, di by di block, and each ui is invertible in its in its own block. And then and then you stick in, you know, do some calculations. And this is what you get. So each block contributes equally to the to the Frobenius to the to the f dimension. Um, the the um, the zero dimension is 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 this involves just the traces, and it's not in general special. Um, but um, but the f dimension Hilbert series looks like this. It just goes block by block, similar to what we had before, and the sp it's special. If each of these guys uh, is one, so uh, that that tells you that. So in other words, U i is a matrix is a matrix whose trace inverse whose inverse trace is D i, um, and then and then you uh, so that's that's so that's the answer. So among the specials, there's a unique one, um, a unique symmetric one, because if because if you want it to be symmetric, then the U i's actually have to be in the center for each of these each of these to remain symmetric. Um, and if it's in the center, then, then this just determines completely what, what multiple, it's a multiple identity and it determines what the multiple is. So there's a unique one. So we recover the well-known lemma, but we see it as a special case. Um, now on the other side, we're interested in, in weakly symmetric. So again, in this situation, then um, the claim is, is that the, the quantum, the F dimension is an integer and it's, and it's just given by a subset of the DI squareds. So if you take if, where i is a subset of the blocks one up to k, so if, if i was the whole subset, then then that would just be the that would just be the dimension of a. So that's equal, the case of equality. Um, and the only restriction on i, it's a subset of one to k, but it should contain all of the i, all of the blocks which are of size one, all the one by one blocks. Um, and what we require for being quite that's just for any Frobenius. Uh, what we require Sorry, um, we we're doing weakly symmetric Frobenius structure, and then these UIs have to have a certain form. Um, each UI has to either be in the um, in, in the symmetric case; it's a multiple of the identity, 
or in the other case, it has to be that the trace of U inverse is zero. And, and, uh, and so that's, that's the requirement on the UIs. And that, so that completely characterizes the weakly symmetric ones. And the F dimension then looks like this, similar to what we had before, but replacing lambda by, uh, replacing the sum over all of the, the I's by capital I. So this symmetric, um, if and only if we, I is the whole thing, and then the dimension is dim A. It's not necessarily the standard one. There's going to be a whole moduli. How many of them are there? Well, there's one mu i, for one parameter mu i for each block. So there's k, it's a k dimensional moduli of symmetric Frobenius structures. Um, uh, and among them, in fact, among all the weakly symmetric intersection special, we again have the unique one. Um, and that's because you, in order to be um, special, uh, we, we can't, we, we will need to be in the case where the UIs are multiples of the identity and then they're uniquely determined um, because uh, we, we, want, we will want the, the, the lollipop associated to each block, it'll need to be invertible. So we can't be in this case. Okay, so that's, that, so that's the answer for the semi-simple case. Um, now, the, uh, I'm gonna apply this to group algebras. So, that's, you know, group algebra is like the most interesting case in computer science is used in Kataya model and places. So we could, um, so the algebra, group algebra is the group extended linearly. It's a Hopf algebra, so we can use Hopf algebra theory. There's a canonical thing which we call integral, but actually in this example, it's just the delta function of the identity. This means it just picks out the identity component of the element of A. Um, and by what I've said, every invertible, every Frobenius form is given by an invertible element of the center. Um, now, what is the center? The center here is spanned by the conjugacy classes. So we know what its dimension is, it's the number of conjugacy classes. And um, the lollipop, from what I've said, well, from the formula I told you before, so the metric is the, um, the integral is just delta E, the, the cap, that's, that's the cup. The cap is just sum over G, G tensor G. And when you, and um, well, G tends to G inverse. So therefore, this is the lollipop. This is the Frobenius dimension, which just picks out the, applies, it just applies um, the, the, twist, the twisted co unit. The, the, twist, the original co unit is delta E, but the twisted one has a U in it. So, so the twisted one is delta E U, and then this is the rest of it is the lollipop. The, um, then the higher dimensions have a similar form. Uh, where we just have, in fact, they're all, they just have a sum over k, k fold copies of G. So it's a huge averaging process over the group. Um, and then you take, and then you take uh, the E component of it. Um, so that's quite an interesting thing from a group theory point of view. It hasn't, certainly hasn't been studied in, by group theorists. Um, if U is in, um, is a group element, then we can regard the, so from these f dimensions of each each k, you can combine them into the into the into a polynomial or power series in X, and um, and then that as a power series, that power series actually is a function regarding it as a function of u. Now, if you restrict u to be in the group, then it's obvious from this formula that this is a class function. It's invariant under conjugation. So we get an intro, we get class so so dim dim x as a function. Of, of, of the twisting parameter becomes a class function. Also, the upside down lollipop from what I've said already over here is just, uh, is just well, this is the lollipop times u and then it's epsilon. So we had that formula earlier. So it's given by this, where you stick in the thing that goes here, you stick it in here and then you do this. Now, if you restrict the upside down lollipop to the group, then again, you get a class function. Um, so, uh, so sorry, there's a, there's a mistake here, precisely in the weakly symmetric case, right? The weakly symmetric case is that it's, it's invariant on the commutator. So this is, so weakly symmetric corresponds to this being a class function. So that's- Hi, John. Sorry, yeah. got a yeah. question. Um, so in this, in this expression for the upside down lollipop, yeah. um, is, is U not meant to be uh, central in G here or is U just some arbitrary? No, no U is arbitrary. Right. In general, in fact, if U is in the center, then we would just have be in the symmetric case. Yeah, okay, okay. Um, yeah, I think, you know what, I think, uh, I think I've got a bit of junk on here. Uh, 
yeah there's i'm sorry there's actually a, a typo here there's not, not meant to be I was I, I was I was doing the symmetric case at the same. I did these rather quickly this morning. So slide. So that I can see why you're confused. So I have to fix this. OK, so uh, what I meant to say was everything is given by invertible U in KG, not the center. A separate statement, the symmetric ones are given by U in the center. OK, and the weakly symmetric ones are given by this upside down lollipop being a class function. OK, so I will go away and correct that. Apologies for the for the. Um, uh, Bad, bad exposition. Uh, quasi special is a bit harder. So quasi special is um, for all what we need is if every con we need this to be a multiple of the identity. So what that amounts to is that if every conjugacy class you restrict the sum to a conjugacy class, then that sum should be zero. So that's the requirement of being quasi special. Okay. So let's just um, yeah let's just move on to the um, well the other thing is is we have the peter valde composition so we do know that the group algebra decomposes into blocks the blocks have a size di or which is the dimension of the irrep vi and we'll let chi i be the normalized character so then the in in those terms the lollipop can be written like this um for the okay we're, st we're, st we're still um doing the weakly symmetric case so this, uh, if you remember, I did the analysis for the symmetric case. When you specialize it to the group algebra, then um, then we're going to have that the that the domain, that the upside down loop looks like this, because I said that it was going to be a, a character. When um, we, in a weakly symmetric case, is going to be a character. It's going to be a, a class function. So it's going to be a linear combination of characters, and this is a, this is it. And we also know that um, from what I said in the general theory. That the weakly symmetric case, the, this is an integer, and it's given by a subset over i of the di's. So we're in this. Now the only question was how many, how many dimension one irreps are there? Well, that's the same as the dimension, the, the cardinality of the of the abelian of the abelianization of G. So that's what this is. That's the number of irreps of, of dimension of dimension one. So that gives us complete understanding of the moduli weakly symmetric ones. I um, mean, uh, well, that's that's a property that they have, and then the full moduli means in each block, um, uh, for, for um, when i is not in capital I, we've got this trace. We've we've got um, arbitrary u i, so that's d squared minus the trace equals zero of u inverse is zero. That's one condition. So we've got this many for each block, and then for every uh, i that's in i, we just have the one-dimensional factor. So that gives you the the dimension of the moduli space for weakly symmetric ones, this altogether. Okay. Now, among them, the moduli of symmetric ones is the one para is one parameter for each irrep. Um, so that's the case where you don't have any of these. I is the maximal case. Um, and then, um, so so for example, for S n, the number of partitions of of n. Are the number of irreps. There are only two which are one dimensional, the sign representation and the trivial one. So we've got, so for the weakly, weakly um, symmetric Frobenius structures, they fall into different strata according to the, the value of this. And there's going to be two to the pn uh, minus two different strata. Um, and this uh, and this quantum dimension, f dimension. Will range between n factorial and two with equality if and only if we're in the symmetric case. So that's the um, that's the, that's the story. Okay, let's look in a bit more detail for S three. Um, so for S three, we're going to have it generated by the the flips of one. So the permutation group of, of three uh, three elements. So flipping one and two, flipping two and three, and then flipping one three is a combination of them. Um, the, the, these are the, there are three reps, one sign and the two dimensional one. Um, now, when you do the analysis, you first you've got to find all the, in, well, all the, so the, I, I'll show you, I won't show you any of that working now, but there's a three parameter family of specials and they're labeled by three parameters, A, B, and C. And so they look, U looks like this. So it has a certain form of U, which is the quantum dimension and this, uh, well, from ABC, 
I define this D. And this is, this is required to be non-zero to be invertible. So that's a condition on you to be on, on the parameters to, for you to be invertible. And then, um, and then from D I build this, I find a quantum dimension that depend on ABC, but only on D. And then the, all of you depends on ABC. Okay. And these are all special. So there's a three parameter family of them. The three parameter family of, um, of symmetric Frobenian structures. So they, here, as I said before, um, U should be in the center. So, so this, is, this is one conjugacy class, it's another one, and it's another one. So this is a central element, a general central element of the, of the group algebra. Um, there's some determinate condition I haven't written down on alpha, beta, gamma to be invertible. Um, the quantum dimension always comes out, the F dimension always comes out to be six, and the entire Hilbert series is this function of X, depending on the parameters. And then we can ask uh, what is about weakly symmetric. So we'll start with the general, a general U. So again, this is a general element U, just written in a, in, in a certain basis. And again, um, but among them, the weakly symmetric, just the weakly symmetric is either the symmetric case, so either two, or if you're looking for the asymmetric weakly symmetric, then there's only one, then there's a moduli, a five dimensional moduli, namely alpha equals gamma, and then the other one's free. So we have a, a so there are six parameters um, and one condition. So we've got five, a five dimensional moduli of weakly symmetric, asymmetric. Um, so basically a, a lot. And they all turn out to have dimension, quantum dimension two, uh, Frobenius dimension two, and this much simpler thing. So this is the results that, you know, it's not, there's a bit more you can say, which we say in the paper, but it's just nice to see an example how it all works. As we know, it had to be an integer between two and six. And so this is one extreme, and these are in fact the only possibilities in this case. Okay, now we're going to do the remaining of the talk, middle of the talk, which is going to be the Hopf algebra case. So, um, so the thing about these examples is that what I've done so far, including group cases, they're semi-simple. And they're basically governed by this block decomposition. I mean, there's some interesting group theory, but if you just want to know what the things are, you can just do it block by block. Um, I want to show you a non-semi-simple example. And um, so we're gonna, you're gonna use, use a hot algebra to generate our example. So every finite dimensional hot algebra has to scale a unique integral, uh, which is a function from itself to the field, and also has an integral element lambda, which is the integral on the dual, regardless of the element of, a, of the hot algebra. And these, this provides the Frobenius form. This provides the inverse Frobenius form according to this formula. Well, if you put u equal to one, that'll be the standard one. That gives you the Frobenius structure. Now we're gonna look at twisting. So we're going to, look, all Frobenius structures are given by the standard one twisted by an invertible u. So this is the formula we're gonna be using. If <clears throat> u was one, that's the standard one. <clears throat> um, now, if u was one, this would just collapse. This would become epsilon of lambda. So it would be quasi special, it's a multiple identity. Unfortunately, that, that multiple is, is known to be zero um, if and only if, it, so it's known to be non-zero if and only if the, the algebra is semi-simple. So we're right back in the semi-simple case, except when it's zero. So it's never going to, this one is never going to be quasi special. Um, in fact, what's going to happen in the standard case is that all of these things are going to be zero in the non-simple case. So it's like the extreme opposite of the one we've been looking at. But we're going to twist by it, and that will generate non-trivial possibilities. Um, so now, uh, the example I'm going to look at is quantum SL2 at UQSL2. So it's something that I think, um, well, for these reasons, this hasn't made much of an impact in computer science, but it is actually implicit behind topological invariance. So um, there ought to be, it ought to play more of a role, which it doesn't yet. Um, because of this problem with the triviality of everything. But it does play a role in the category it generates, it gives you a modular category. So if you're doing top quantum, quantum computing from the, from the categorical point of view, you are interested in this guy, but somehow it doesn't fit with the ZX approach. <clears throat> so, so this is going towards rectifying that. Um, so Q to the N is one, uh, is a primitive nth root of unity. There shouldn't be any smaller N, which is true. And um, it's generated by K, F, and E. K to the N is one, E to the N, F to the N is zero. So that means it has dimension N cubed. 
as an algebra. And then there's this commutation relation between E and K, it's Q commutes, F and K Q commutes, and then this SL2 type relation. If you know the Lie algebra SL2, this should remind you of that. Um, now, when Q is minus one, we emit, so when N is two, we just emit this factor, then everything still makes sense. We have a really good hot algebra. The uh, N cubed, um, well, okay, on this, on this thing, we take a, this N cubed is actually given by a monomial basis, K to the I, F to the J, E to the K. And the integral just has support only when I is one and J and K are top. That is to say N minus one. And the integral element is just given by the top ones and this certain element lambda k. And lambda k is a sum over all the k's. So this is all given it quite explicitly in my other paper. Um, so that's going to be our hop algebra. Now we're going to twist it. So let's first do the twisting in the in the n equals two case. So then two case, the relations are that the e's and f's commute and the E's and K's anti-commute, this, this, this curly bracket is anti-commute commutator. Um, <clears throat> the integral has support here. The inverse, the, the, the lambda give, and the construction I told you gives you the cap for the Frobenius structure and it comes out to be this. So this, is the, so this gives you the Frobenius structure. Um, the, an invertible element looks like this, A, B, C, D, it's eight dimensional, so there's eight, there are eight parameters. And uh, to be invertible, it's just the one condition that A squared is not equal to B, B, B squared, then that element is invertible. Um, the, the twisted Frobenius linear form uh, has support on the monomial basis. Take the monomial basis in, in the standard order, in the order I've taken for you. I'll take this order for the basis, and then in that order, this is what upside down U looks like. Uh, and that allows you then to compute everything. So the f dimension, the zero dimension is just epsilon of one, so that's just d. The um, applying epsilon u to, well, the lollipop looks like this. The upside down lollipop looks like this as a as a as a map linear map on in the same basis order. Um, when you apply the f dimension, when you apply upside down lollipop on e f, you'll be getting on this term. So you'll get an extra b. So this is therefore the upset. Therefore, this is the quantum dimension when you apply epsilon u to the lollipop. Um, the and the entire Hilbert series looks like this. Notice it's just because because this squares to all product powers of, of of this are zero because e squared is zero. So therefore, lollipop squared is zero, and therefore the all the higher quantum dimensions are zero, and therefore the Hilbert series just is just uh, linear constant plus linear. Now the commutator, the, all the things in the image of the commutator, they just span by these five elements. Five, yeah. And the center is just spanned by these, by these elements. Um, so what that information tells you is that firstly, um, so from what I've, what's written on this page, you can deduce the following. Firstly, there's an eight dimensional modular linear structures. None of them are special because that's never going to be a multiple of the identity. So none of them are specials. Um, they are all weakly symmetric because this guy doesn't have any support on any of those guys. So it vanishes on the commutator. So they're all weakly symmetric. And there's a three-dimensional moduli of symmetric ones according to the center. So this gives you the moduli of symmetric ones. So that's a complete analysis for n equals two. For n equals three, it's a lot harder. And I, I have got the software to do the full analysis, but unfortunately I can't run it <laughs> as much as I'd like. This um, try running it in the supercluster, but at the moment I can just give you some partial results. So for n equals three, um, we've got 27 dimensional. We'll take this basis. Um, now U is gonna be in the, a bit with any E's or F's plus all the rest with E's and F's. I'm going to, uh, and to be invertible, the element you just it only depends on these guys. And the condition is this, that this quantity, which I call little delta should be non-zero. Now, um, the canonical Frobenius, so now the standard one is not standard one for any hop algebra, it's useless. All the lollipops and things are zero, but it is asymmetric. On the other hand, we're not using that. So the question is, is there a natural symmetric one? And the answer is there is a natural symmetric one. Um, you can take as a reference. 
and that is just u to be k. So that's certainly a, a basis condition. It's just this term here. Um, so then that gives you the lollipop is this, where CQ is actually the, the quadratic Casimir. It's this element here. It's a central element. Uh, we know the lipple has to be in the center. So it has to be in the, in the, in the center. So and this, is the, this is the central element that you get. Um, the, the, the zero dimension, there should be a comma somewhere here. The zero dimension is, uh, is just zero. And the usual dimension is 27. It's at, the, the F dimension is 27. It's the same as the classical one, because it has to be because it's symmetric. And the higher ones are given by this, by this formula. This is not the same. This is putting J equal one isn't this. Okay, so this behaves really weirdly, but it stabilizes after large, after dimension bigger than two, it's given by this uniform formula. Um, so you can write down the Hilbert series from that. Now the four-dimensional moduli of so that's a reference one that implies that there's a four-dimensional moduli of symmetric Frobenius forms written of the form uh, reference one times z where z is in the center. The center here is spanned by these four elements. It's four-dimensional. CQ, as I mentioned, is a quadratic Casimir and lambda is the element which is the integral on the dual. Um, if you're interested, CQ cubed is actually a, 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 takes you back down to CQ. So um, so that's why you have a four-dimensional algebra here. Now, um, uh, Sean. Yeah. Sorry, I just I just lost track. Uh, what's what's n here? So what's n equals two? N equals three? Uh, it's it's q to the n is one. So it's this oh, is the okay. root of unity. Previous one was q equals minus one with the second root of unity. Uh huh. Okay. So previously q was minus one. Now we're doing q is e to the two pi i over three. Uh huh. Okay. Um, so uh, so. So now, so that's, that's so that's a full story for the if you're interested in Frobenius structures, then that's that's the answer. There's a, there's a four-dimensional moduli of them. For um, a for the center for the uh, more generally, we we consider any anything here. I'm just going to focus on none of the rest. So just focus on this bit, and it's only because of computer limitations, nothing else. Um, within this class, we can work out again. We have zero for the zero for the for the for the zero dimension. We have this for the quantum dimension, for the f dimension. So now this is, if um, if we were in the previous case, we would just have 27. We're in the symmetric case, we'd have 27. But in general, it's not an integer. Um, and these are what the higher higher ones look like. So the lollipop is a certain polynomial. I could tell you the formula for it. It's quite complicated. And when you see the polynomial, when you see the formula, you discover that it's never a multiple. You can't. You, there are no values of parameters that make it a multiple identity, so it's never special. And it's symmetric. Um, that when this is when this is in the center, that only happens when u zero and and u two are zero. And then if you look for weakly symmetric, if you look at the upside down lollipop and look for that to be uh, vanish on commutators, you don't find any within this class. So and not, I'm not saying there aren't any at all. I'm pretty sure there are some, but they're not in this class. So that gives you a flavor of n equals three. I'll just end with the general case. I have run out of time now. Um, so in the general case, we haven't been able to prove too much, but certainly you can ask when is, what's an invertible element of UQSLN, SL2, I mean, n root of unity. And the answer is that it should look like this. This is the, what we had before, plus the rest. The rest means things involving E's and F's. And it turns out it just depends on, on this circulant matrix. So this is like, this is a circulant matrix. You take that vector and you s rotate it cyclically. That determinant should be non-zero. So if you take that for n equals three, you just had th this condition here. You just get this condition here. Um, and for, uh, and so, so then, and also we can show that there is a canonical symmetric Frobenius form with u equals k. That's because of the support of, I mean, there's an argument for that. But the support of the integral was only on k f squared e squared, uh, e f, sorry, k f to the n minus one, e to the n minus one. And that means if you twist by this element, u, then that object, that new bilinear form, um, or the linear form corresponding to it, will have support only on f to the n minus one, e to the n minus one. And then when you look at the commutation relations in a lot of detail, you discover that the commutation relations will always involve things of a lower degree. In, in E's and F's. And so that will show that this actually is symmetric. It's, it's not a trivial calculation. The, um, and then once you've got the reference one, then the moduli of all of them is given by the dimension of the center. 
Now that isn't actually known as far as I can tell. I don't certainly don't know it, but it is known if n is an odd prime, then um, there's a, a result of Kohler, Thomas Kohler, that, that this is dimension um, 3n minus one all over two, which fits with what we had before. Um, I expect that there are no specials to be found. I expect that there are plenty of asymmetric, weak asymmetric Frobenius structures. So that's, but that's not proven. Okay, so I, all I wanted to convince you today was that there is a rich theory of asymmetric Venus algebras. It was inspired by the, by the, by the beads in the, in the planar spider theorem, um, and the theorem applies to them. Um, in fact, if you didn't have a rich moduli of asymmetric Venus structures, then there wouldn't be any point having the general, having the spider, th the planar spider theorem, because you wouldn't have any examples. But that's actually why we studied all this in the paper. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Um, so I was wondering, so I have a couple of questions, but uh, but I was going to open it up to, to see if other people have questions first. Um, yeah, maybe I can ask questions. So um, I'm sitting next to Kauten on this laptop, so that's why you two voices from the same computer. Um, I was just wondering, because this is like a, you start out by this planar spider theorem. Is there yeah. anything to be said in the non-planar case? Like obviously if the Frobenius algebra is symmetric, then it's the same thing. But if it's not symmetric, can you still do something with that? Well, um, okay, so that's an interesting question. So the point, the point is, so in the asymmetric case, um, you, the theorem is basically a lot weaker than you would like it to be, right? It only says, what you're saying is, is, uh, if I understand your question, is that, okay, you've got this theorem, but it only tells you that, that diagrams like this are equal, that all diagrams uh, which are planar, and, but you could ask if you've got a composition of these diagrams, of these morphisms that is not planar, what could you say about it? And, right, that's, that's your question. Yeah, that's the question, yeah. And, and, um, and the answer is probably, but it's not at all known, but the reason that it might be possible is it, certainly not in general, um, but um, you could expect that there is an, an, a braided version of, well, okay, so let me back up. So in the symmetric case, obviously we know that theory. If you now do the symmetric case, but in a braided category, so a braided symmetric one, then you would involve braid diagrams. And then you would follow the, the proof in the in the, the braided in the symmetric case, but you adapt, adapt it to the braided case. So that is surely doable. So you'll have some theorem, which is not completely obvious what it looks like, but you'll have some theorem which should be doable uh, in the braided symmetric case. Um, but you would need a bit more structure. Uh, you need and you would need the objects to be you you would need um, to have some operators to assign to the braid crossings and uh, for, it, for, it, for it to make sense. I don't see how you can say anything otherwise. But if you were to do that, then it would probably link up with UQSL2 and the things that you can do with UQSL2 where you can construct topological invariants of, uh, of knots in, in R3 or S, um, in S3. So it should all tie up, but it's, a very, it's an interesting question. We should tie up somehow at the end of the day like that. Okay, thanks. Um, so I was going to ask. So you uh, you use this uh, like bead invariant to um, to classify some of these Hopf algebras as well. Um, so I think that there's something where if you have a Frobenius structure and then also a Phi algebra, then this automatically defines some kind of Hopf algebra. I, I think that this is true. Uh, I think there's a paper by Ross. Uh, yeah, I think it's just working the usual proof backwards. I, I mean, okay. I think um, that's it. I mean, I don't know. I don't know the theorem exactly, but I can believe it because when you um, when you look at the formula for the general case of a Hopf algebra, um, I I kind of I kind of omitted it. But if you imagine u is one, then this is the then the, the then the Frobenius structure given by the integral and the and the inverse integral, but it involves the antipode. So if you didn't have the antipode, but you had G and, and this, you could reconstruct the antipode from it. Yeah, okay. So that's what's going on there. Okay, yeah, my question was going to be whether you could, whether it would be this uh, invariant would be useful to try to classify um, some, some uh, 
class of uh, of hop algebras um, in the same kind of vein that you're doing here. You mean a bi algebras? Yeah. So if if you have like if you if you know that you start off with if you know that your Hopf algebra is constructed from a Frobenius algebra that's that's also a bi algebra, then um, then presumably you can you can still use this kind of um, invariant to try to classify them. But I think you'd I think you'd just be back in the setting. I think when as soon as you know it's a Hopf algebra, then your original Frobenius structure will just be of this form. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's, it's just a, it's just I mean it's a it's an interesting way of putting it, but it's not going to give you anything new. It's just mm -hmm. you're going to get a Hopf algebra. Then if you had the Hopf algebra, you just go you follow the standard construction. Yeah. So um, yeah. So I, I don't think that would give you new hot found I don't, in other words i think every hot found well okay okay I, well, let me just let me just think about this so what you're saying is 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 every hot algebra given by a bi algebra equipped with a Frobenius form um for which there's some then pro process i mean it's not, are you saying are you so are you is is the theorem you're referring to does it say that the bi algebra it turns out to be a hot algebra or you obtain a hot algebra from it uh, it turns out to be a hop algebra. Right. So then you just yeah. So then you're just what I said. You're just you're just you're just rediscovering what you already knew from another point of view. Yeah. Someone you know, basically having a Fabian structure is largely equivalent to having the antipode mm -hmm, mm -hmm. through, the, through yeah. this through this dictionary. It's not going to give you any new examples. Every hop algebra is going to be obtainable in that way, um, just because the bi algebra you thought you had wasn't actually a bi algebra. It was actually a hop algebra anyway. Mm -hmm. Okay. You see what I mean? Yeah, okay, thanks. I have a, I have a question um, about, about specialness. Um, so a, a while back, um, me and Chris Aaron were, were sort of puzzled about this kind of idea that, so if you're not going to assume that your algebra is symmetric, Mm -hmm. There seem to be at least two different ways that you can say that a Frobenius algebra is special. Uh, one is where I take a co-multiplication and I plug in a multiplication and that equals the identity, which I think is the one that you that you've yeah. written, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. The other is that you can take, if you take the multiplication, yeah. um, and you and you turn that into a linear form uh by by tracing um so basically send, send an element a to yeah. to to the trace of left multiplication by yeah. a that, that'll that'll be the trace form so the trace form yeah That's the trace form yeah that will and give you a special one but that will always be symmetric so yeah so if you so yeah so so if the trace form equals your 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 co-unit of the Frobenius algebra then it's symmetric and special uh, is it possible to have something that is special and not symmetric in the sense yeah. that you said? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, we did that in the, we did that in the, um, we did that in the, in fact, that, that generally that's the case. So we, we, if, for example, in the, in the finite group case, we had lots of that. See, we had a, we had, these were all the specials. These are all the symmetric and there's only, only one point of intersection, which is the unique trace form. Right. Okay. So I, I should have said that. So if you look at this parameter space carefully, um, for, for to, to be in this parameter space, we have to have um, we don't have to have a, b, and c to be zero. Mm -hmm. um, but to be in 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 um, yeah. So anyway, when you when you think it through, you discover that the only intersection of these two is is the is the standard standard symmetric special, which is unique. Right. So, so it's a much so there's the one large dimensional moduli space, another large dimensional moduli space, and there's a one point of intersection, which is the, the symmetric trace form. The, the trace form. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's interesting because it kind of topologically they seem to be doing the same job, right? Right. The, those two those two equations say that basically that you can pop a you can get rid of a hole in your diagram. Yeah, uh, but somehow this trace form thing is it, it ends up being much stronger. Um, maybe yeah. maybe it's just that our topological intuitions are really coming from having symmetric Frobenius algebras anyway. Yeah, I th I think so. I th but I mean, I think special is definitely interesting, and I don't think um, 
I, I think I like specials because then you don't have any units. As I, as I mentioned, the units disappear, they're automatic. And so it's more topological in some sense. Um, and so I think, but, but it's asymmetric. So I think this guy could be, use, you could be useful in some kind of sort of context like that. But it is, as you said, it is kind of different from the usual point of view, yeah. I'm not quite sure why, why you want to focus on the trace form particularly, because that's just, that was, the trace form was the construction we used actually in this, in, in reproving this lemma. So the trace form was just, this was the trace form. We just make the block decomposition and we just take this, uh, which is just gives you the left leg representation, but you can throw in any U here that you like. And that's, and that's how we analyze the general case. Um, and so then among the specials, there's a unique symmetric one. So that's the same phenomena. There's lots of specials because these, because these, um, uh, these UIs, um, uh, they don't, well, the UIs don't have to be in the center. So the, where did I write down the lollipop? Let's go back to this mm -hmm. one. I, I, you know, there's a few too many typos here, but the lollipop, the lollipop here was, was already quite special on, on, N, on N by N matrices. So, um, yeah, actually, I don't know what I'm saying here. This is, this is not, this is, um, um, yeah, well, so yeah, so here's what I'm saying. There are lots of specials. All we require is that the trace of UI over DI is a constant. So we just require, so UI doesn't have to be multiple identity. identity. The, the symmetric case is when the UIs are all multiple to the identity, then they commute with everything and then the trace form is, remains symmetric after when you insert the U. But if you insert the U, if you insert a U in here, you don't need it to be in the, a multiple identity. So if it isn't, it will be asymmetric. But you do, but if it, but it will mm -hmm. remain special if you if if the trace of U inverse is D, is is of each block is is di. So you've got so this is what I said. You've got an n squared n, a di, di squared um, minus one size moduli space for each block of specials, mm -hmm. uh, um, and and and, uh, and only one of them is is the symmetric one. Okay, so that that's the full story. In the so in the semi simple case, the story is very simple. And it just comes down to analyzing the, the block separately. Looks like this. And there was a condition you had somewhere where you had a traceless U playing a role, right? Yeah, that was for the weekly symmetric analysis. So weekly symmetric um, here, um, we had integer, this, this is an integer, and where the i's run over any subset of the blocks. And then mm -hmm. each block, the UI, has to be either that UI is a multiple identity, so that block is symmetric, uh, or the trace of UI is zero, and so that can never that that so that bit can never be quasi can never be special. So the intersection of weakly symmetric and special is going to be for a semi-simple case is going to be just uh, is going to be just the intersection of symmetric and special that would be only this branch. You can never have this branch, and so and so that's 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 a, that's a strengthening of the usual lemma. Usual lemma says that symmetric intersection special is unique. Actually, what it's saying the weakly symmetric intersection special is unique. It's slightly stronger, um, but the um, and, and it just corresponds to yeah. But in general, you have these branches where you have these trace zero condition. They don't appear in the in the quantum dimension mm -hmm. or any other quantum dimensions. So that's that's the general picture. So as I say, the paper has a complete a complete understanding of the of the semi simple case. It's um, from this point of view, although I still think it's interesting for group theorists. Okay. I have a I have another question, but I can let let somebody else jump in if they. Uh... Are there any other questions? No, I think you're on then, Alex. Okay, um, so so I noticed at at some point you you had things stated for um, for a sufficiently large field of characteristics. Oh uh, yeah, okay. So I mean, just what's just going on there? Uh, yeah. It's just that every semi-simple algebra doesn't have to have a block decomposition. So for the Wedderburn theorem to hold, mm -hmm. you have to you have to be able to solve enough equations involving in in the field. So either just take the field to be to be to be C. Or it can be characteristic zero, but then, you, but not every field will. It won't necessarily work. It depends on the algebra. Mm, so, okay. Okay. I, I'm not actually enough of a number theorist to give you the, the completely precise statement, but there is a complete precise statement you can find in textbooks for that. Mm. 
but so so this is just playing a role in getting the Wedderburn theorem. Yeah, the yeah, we're just using it uh -huh. to have a block decomposition, nothing else. See. I could just set over C, but since it was a mass paper, we just wrote it like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I think that's probably it. Okay, yeah, thanks for that, Thanks, thanks very much. Really great audience. So, well, I can't see the audience when I'm when I when I'm giving my talk, but I think you've been a great audience. Okay. All right. Cheers. Bye, everybody. I'll see you Thank guys. You. I'll see Bye. you guys in January. Okay. Yeah. Bye. Bye.